Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of There's No Business Like. I'm here today with Brian. Hey, Danielle. How you doing? I'm Brian Zellmer from KU Presents. I'm doing awesome. How are you, Kevin? I'm great. I'm Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts. And Katie. Hey, everyone. Katie Miller with the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. And Josh. Josh Benson with the Marion Cultural and Civic Center down in Marion, Illinois. And I'm Danielle Van Hook at the Alden in McLean, Virginia. Um, so we have a really awesome interview today. And before we get started, I want to ask you a question that's going to feel very unrelated to a lot of the other conversations we had. So I would love to hear you all reflect on what does the concept of safety mean to you? Yeah, Danielle, I can kick off with that one. For me, physical and psychological safety, that's what that means to me is in both of those ways. So in 2020, I was out for a walk, honestly, with my son one afternoon, and I realized that I was really safe in my neighborhood. And I could take him out for a walk or we could go to the park and play. And I never had to question whether I would be safe or my son would be safe. Part of that thought, my thought process and like, oh, I feel safe is like, I feel safe as a woman in my neighborhood. Like there are times where I don't feel safe as a woman in general in the world. And my neighborhood is pretty safe for me to walk by myself or with my kid. And I had this moment of realization that that is not the case for so many people. And it really struck me and that frankly, is what has driven a lot of the work that I have done in the social justice space with my arts work for the last two and a half to three years, is that sense of like, I feel safe, but other people in my community do not. And what can I do about that? Yeah, I think similarly, like Katie, I think if you'd asked me this question, you know, two or three years ago, before I really started doing this work, my answer would have been something more along the lines of like, career and financial safety of just being like, feeling like I had a safety net or feeling like, you know, i could afford food like that, that sort of safety. Um, But now I think it's still that for me, but also a recognition of the safety aspect that I sort of naturally have as a straight white male. I feel somewhat similar to, to Kevin's perspective is that I know that within today's society, I have a very limited view on this just because I'm a, I'm a straight white male and I'm also large physically and in turn, have never really since I've been an adult felt for my safety often. And that speaks to my privilege and, and just understanding and acknowledging that privilege is the extent of what I can do about that for myself past gaining a further understanding of what others experiences are like outside of my own. What safety feels like for me, you you ask, what does it feel like for me? So we kind of all like looked externally. So I'm going to look internally when I feel safe. I'm not thinking about feeling safe or not. I'm just being myself. I'm not thinking about I'm not thinking about the way I talk. I'm not thinking about, you know, the way I'm dressed. I don't think about what other people are thinking about me when I'm completely safe in every kind of way. I'm just comfortable in, you know, physically, mentally, you know, in in the environment that I'm in at that moment. Um you know, and I wish those times were more often than they actually occur. The truth is I think about safety all the time. <laughs> like I'm a paranoid like you know, just very like, oh, what's going to, what can go wrong? I'm always looking to see what can go wrong. And part of that's the theater background because, you know, theater safety is all about, well, you can be maimed if you're not careful with this. You can be killed if, you know, you do this. And like, so I'm always like looking for the danger. And so that's the problem. It carries over to my day-to-day life. I'm always looking for the danger in a completely different way. (laughs) For fun. (laughs) You're looking for, I think, for an entertainment purpose. One of my, so one of my people was like. I think you say that, but I also think that that's not entirely true. (laughs) Well, what like, I agree. So one of my staff went up uh, the ladder to the loading rail and they were like, yeah, I just can't reach out and get this and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, (laughs) hold on. Stay there. I said, I'll need you to hold on to me as I lean out. That is not Benson, do you see my mom face right now? (laughs) Benson, (laughs) don't do that. It was perfectly safe. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, I think the idea of safety is complicated. There's it, it is so intrinsic to everything we do in life. But, you know, like you said, Brian, 
um, you know, we probably feel the safest um, whenever we're not thinking about it. So I I asked this question um, because we're leading in today to an interview with choreographer, dancer, and just general creative leader, Dominic Moore Dunson. And he's going to reference in um, the interview a podcast that he has done. And the question that he starts out with is asking his interviewees about their perception of safety. They begin reflecting on safety. He has a wonderful podcast series as well as other artistic works that kind of start from that place and do um, eventually lead to his experience and with other people's lived experience about um, police violence. And so I do want to mention at the top that we are going to talk a bit about that in this episode, Um, but we are going to, we're not going to belabor it. We're not going to stay on. Um, So uh, take care when listening. And if you feel like you need to skip 15 seconds, go for it. Yeah, my name is Dominic Moore Dunson. I'm a dancer and choreographer from Akron, Ohio. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Akron Black Artist Guild. Let's start with your origin story. How did you get to being the artistic force that you are today? So I started, a lot of people in the dance world who are guys usually have the story of dan- you know finding dance in middle school, high school. Um, I'm one of the very few who started dancing when they were two or three. Um, And the other side of the classic story is I have an older sister, mom put her in dance class, I was at home making trouble, and she was like, you gonna go too, because I need you out the house. So I ended up just going to dance with my sister, and I loved it. And I just honestly kept doing it because my sister did it. And I think around high school, when I went to performing arts high school in Akron, was the time I started to like realize, like, oh, I have my own love for this thing. Um, Shout out Firestone High School. And... At the high school, they had a deep relationship with Dance Cleveland, um, the oldest modern dance presenter in the country. So they were bringing Martha Graham down. They were bringing Ron Brown down. um, And there was a summer, well, there was a spring where Garth Fagan came to our school. His dancers came. They taught his class. They were really impressed by me, so they invited me to his show. So me and my mom, we went, and... They came out to find me after the show and said, we want you to meet Garth. And I was like, okay, cool. You know what I mean? Um, And at this point, I'm 16. I have no context for who this man is, like zero. So I meet him, shake his hand, and he's like, I'm going to give you a full scholarship to come to my summer intensive. And I was like, oh, cool. Again, no context. I'm just like, this is cool. I mean, yeah, this really cool old man just invited me to his um, intensive. So I decided to go. Um, First time I ever left home by myself. And during that... 13 days span, there was like a uh, young person's like class that was, you know, obviously of age to be in that. There wasn't an adult class and there was like the company classes. So I spent two days with the kids and then they moved me to the adults. So I was like dancing with all the adults and then after two days they moved me to the company. So I was taking company class as a 16 year old and they rehearsed twice a day. I was very tired. Um, it was kind of the first time I realized like, oh, I can kind of hang with professionals. Kind of? Yeah, I was just like, I can kind of hang with, this, like, this is cool, right? Yeah. Um, again, I was so naive. Like, it didn't mean nothing to me. I was like, oh, people can really dance. I like being in a room where people can really, really dance. Um, and it was hard, and it was hot in the studio, and it just felt great on the body. And then one day, um, through the person who was my supervisor, kind of when I was living, because I was a minor, I was told that Garth wanted to take me out for dinner. So I was like, again, cool, all right. Um, so I hop in the man's Porsche utility vehicle and I was like, this is a nice car for a choreographer. What you, what you doing? Um, and I know he was the choreographer of Lion King on Broadway at the time. And he takes me to this restaurant. We walk in, um, he's like, says hi to the chef and we go sit down at this table. And the moment I realized he was a big deal was we were sitting at this table and his company's logo was engraved into the table and the logo had his face on it. And I was like, you, you realize your face is on the table, right? <laughs> <laughs> we just had this great time because at the time he just felt like um, a really cool grandpa that I got to talk to about dance. Um, and he told me during that sit down that like, you know, if I wanted to, if I was interested, like I could join the company at 16, 17 years old. At the time, that was a little much for me because I'd never left home before. So I was like, ah, I'm cool, but thank you. Um, but that was really the first time I was like, oh, I can do this. You know, and then fast forward 
when I got into my professional career in Cleveland, um, that's where I really learned that you could use dance to impact people's lives. Like you could use dance and the practice of dance as an art form to engage with people past the stage. And that has more impact than them, than them just seeing your show. Right. And between like kind of the spirit of what I learned at Garth and the spirit of what I learned in Cleveland, I've kind of taken that on. Wow. Um, can you tell me about some of the dance projects you're working on right now? Yeah. So right now I have a project called In Cop Negro. Um, it's a response to 2020. Me and my wife were pregnant with our son, Maverick, and we were all in quarantine. And Ahmaud Arbery was killed. George Floyd was killed. Um, but because we were in quarantine, me and my wife were very, um, we didn't want to go outside. Because, like, there's all these marches. We wanted to be a part of it. But we were also, like, we don't understand COVID-19. And she's pregnant. And the boys do in August. So, like, we weren't going anywhere. So we were, like, in this fishbowl watching the world turn upside down just through our phones and the TV. And so there was a lot of conversations. Um, and one of the, the conversations that came up was, so we're about to have a black boy. And I'm going to need to tell him about police. Because in the house, my wife is white. So I'm the only one who can Mm -hmm. And that really, like, hit me weirdly. Like, I don't know why that day I was just like, yo, like, this is a responsibility, like, I wasn't prepared for or thinking about. So I just started asking people, like, what do you tell your kids? Like, what do you, how do you do this? And everyone was just like, ah, you just tell them how to get home, man. Like, that's all you do. And I was just like, I hear you, but it's got to be more than that, right? Like, that, that's still on that kind of, like, trauma survival stuff. And I'm like, I'm... I don't want to raise another generation to, to live like that. So I started asking more people and asking more people. And over quarantine, I happened to learn how to podcast through this program. So I was like, I'm interviewing all these people anyway. Why don't I just record the interviews and turn them into a podcast? So then I can archive them. So when I go into the studio, I can listen back to this stuff, but also I can make something for people to listen to. Um, so I made a podcast called Incop Negro Black and Blue. It is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, <laughs> Keep plugging. <laughs> right. Um, but at the same time, I started creating a show called Incop Negro Aftermath in response to the podcast. Mm. So the podcast and the piece are in conversation with one another. So that piece, um, prophetically, is about what a black community goes through after police violence and how do they collectively heal from it? Like what are the relationships like? And so I was in the process of making that. And then in June of 2022, um, Jalen Walker was murdered by police seven minutes away from my house. Mm. And that's why I say prophetically, I was already talking about that. And then it happened in our city. Um, for those who don't know, Akron's like a, a little under 200,000 people mm. were, you know, small, smaller Midwestern city. Um, so then all of a sudden this conversation that felt in some ways theoretical was very real because at home. So now like I'm really, um, there's a different kind of energy in me getting this work done. Um, it's going to premiere in June. Um, but so that's one of the projects I'm working on. And another project I'm working on uh, is called Artie and the Black Card. And it is a show um, for young audiences about a young black boy who... His mom realizes that he doesn't understand a lot about who he is as a black person. So she decides to send him to school to learn how to be black. <laughs> so on a single school day, he goes through all these cl classes like how to dance on beat, thug on 101, and others in order to get his black card. <laughs> so those are some, some of the stuff I'm working on. I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> So whenever people come and see your work, is there a response that you want the audience to take away? Is there a different response that you want different people in the audience to take away? You know, I, I really, for a long time, I think I struggled with that, like this balance between like make something and let the chips fall where they may and make something with a specific idea of what you want people to walk away with. I think it changes my piece, honestly. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that I really... I really, really love stand-up comedy. And one of the things I love about stand-up comedy is these comedians, like, live in the world, right? They're with us. They're just people living in the world. And then they kind of, like, pay attention to what other people are saying about different topics. And at some point, they find what their specific take is on a topic, and that's what they build a show around. So I really try to emulate that when I mm. build shows. So I, I really, like, with Incom Negro, it's like there's been a lot of work about 
police reform, police brutality, and all these things over the years. And as I was kind of making the project, I was like, okay, but what's my specific take that I haven't heard someone say that only I can say the way I'm going to say it? Already in the black card, very similar. I've seen a lot of work about black identity, but I've never seen somebody make something funny about it on stage as a choreographer, and I've never seen somebody say, but what if we had to go to school to learn how to be black? What would that be like, <laughs> right? So I was like, that's my take, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think when people are in the audience, I usually have like a, a take I wanna get across to you, mm -hmm. but ultimately like, think what you think, right? Like hear mine, agree, disagree. Um, it's just my job to be clear about exactly what I'm trying to get across to you, but I'm not trying to tell you what you should be thinking about the work. Is that something that's changed over time? Do you think that's like a maturity in just creating more work? Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think when you get started, you really have this like thing you want to say and you want everybody to walk away being like, they're so brilliant for that thing they said. And after a while, you realize that your job isn't to make people think mm -hmm. like they can just come and just watch and not think a thing the entire time, which is also cool. Yeah. Right. But to me, dance is really about engaging in a shared experience with someone else's body, right? Like our mm -hmm. job as dancers and choreographers is to make the body move in such a way it brings about an emotional response that might not be intellectual. It might literally be in the person's body as they're sitting there. And that's also cool. Yeah. While I'm sitting here listening to you talk, I'm just thinking it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about a lot of things about your identity and a lot of the harm that's happened um, in your community. It's a whole other thing to put that in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really, the rehearsal process is one that we have to be really careful with. Um, some of the process has been listening back to interviews where people are saying like somewhat traumatic stuff about their lives. And, you know, let me be clear, like some of these interviews aren't just like everyday people. They're also cops. Right. They're black police officers. And one of the things those black police officers talk about is like, I'm black and I'm blue. Right. And that's a really hard life to deal with. And I feel kind of crazy. And they tell talk about these experiences where, you know, there was one black officer who talked about he basically outed somebody in the police department for racist practices and stuff like that. And the next time they're out on the job, the kind of group he was in and they're like busting down a door or whatever. Sorry, I don't know all the like the right <laughs> lingo for this stuff. But, <laughs> but he felt a gun at the back of his head right when they're in the middle of like busting somebody and like the person whispered very clearly that like keep doing what you're doing and next time this isn't going to end well for you and then he just had to keep working so like we're listening to the stuff in the studio and like we have to like take that in and then put in our bodies and then like use that and then yeah. like just walk away from it right but like when it's in your body it never just goes away right so we have to be like very careful in our process of like how much information we're taking in at any given time. And then because the piece is about healing in a lot of ways, like we have to always talk about like making sure we're not trauma mining a lot in our bodies and being like, let's yeah. show people how difficult it is to be black all the time, right? Because that just gets really, really difficult. So that's not what that works about. It's just not about how hard it is. It's about let's be vulnerable about what happens to us afterwards and let's talk about how we can get somewhere afterwards. So that's actually um, the first time I've heard the phrase trauma mining. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, it's, a, it's a phrase I've recently heard. And it's the act of like, I mean, if you just think about what mining is, right? Like mining for coal, like really digging into fine gold, right? And it's the same thing with like artists, how we have to like mine our own trauma to find like the thing that's going to make people go, wow, this is great art, right? When I heard it, the person who said it said in the context of how we have to do that in order to create a great application that goes to a funder to be valid, right? Like, they're not going to give black black people money to talk about, like, circles and squares, right? And, like, let's be honest, we all know some white choreographers who are out here talking about circles and squares, right? And, like, <laughs> and they're, like, making stuff, and you're like, all right, cool, homie, but, like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but, like... When you're a black creator, when you're a creator of color, like, you got to talk about, like, you know, hands up, don't shoot. You got to talk about, like, uh, sexual abuse in your community. You got to talk about these really, really hard things that are all really, really traumatic. So you have to, like, dig down and find the trauma in your life and pull it up to put on that grant application to get money to then have to go 
re-traumatize yourself and your dancers and your folks to make that work, to present it, only to have to do that all over again next, the next time you want to make a new thing. So that's kind of what the trauma mining idea is from. That's heavy and yeah. that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I think that's. That in yeah. order to work, that's, mm -hmm. that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really weird thing because it's like, I think pre pandemic, it was obviously still going on because it's kind of always been a thing. Post pandemic, when everyone's like, we, you know, we want to help black folks make art. They want you to talk about all the stuff that like came up during the racial reconciliation of America in 2020. And there's a lot of black creators who are like, but I don't want to though. Like I have some other stuff I want to make. It ain't got nothing to do with that, but they're like, oh, but don't you, shouldn't you, isn't this what this community needs? And it's like, it might be what you need, but we shouldn't be putting the, the racial work of white America on the shoulders of black folks especially when it comes to art making. Well, and especially when it comes to access to the financial resources mm -hmm. for art making. Mm -hmm. That part. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to talk to you about grant funding today. I mean, that just sparks so many questions of how, how can we make this better? Like, is there a world where you could be inspired by birds? <laughs> I've seen so many dance shows, right, where it's, you know, this beautiful story of walking through the park and there's a gorgeous piece about how we're so connected to the earth right it's it, a fully valid thing i am not making mm -hmm. I, i'm not trying to elicit mm -hmm. anything other than no, I feel you. you know just something that's not so deeply personal yeah. to you is there something that you think would need to change well i think it's so hard, right? Because like we can we can talk about it from like a systemic standpoint, which I always think is generally the answer to this stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm so knowledgeable about the funding community that I understand what to change. But I think from like a human level, like, do you know black people? Like, do you, do you know that like we also love flowers, we also love birds, we also love nature, like we also love like if you think our whole experience is just set around racism, uh, American slavery, inequity, of course, when you give money, that's all you're going to give money to because you think that's what our, you think that's the authentic black experience, right? Mm -hmm. When the authentic black experience is this very similar to yours, it's just through a certain lens, right? Like, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a piece I want to make next called Black by Nature. And it's about black folks being in nature and you know i haven't found my take on it but it's this idea of like black people also love to be in nature if you look at us historically we were agriculture people in this country we made the food up in here you know i mean that was part of our yeah. lives came up north got urbanized old thing and then everybody white flight happened they took over the space and now we're in this place where like we're really disconnected from land um but i have concerns that like the only way that's going to get funded is if I talk about like how we were stolen from Africa and we came over here and our history is this and then we had to run from these agricultural places because they were dangerous and how that's like trauma in our bodies so we can't connect to nature and like that I feel like that's the only way it's going to get funded where I just want to make a piece about black people being parallel to the beauty of nature the end black bodies dancing amongst nature that's it beautiful but i'm like well, who's gonna fund that <laughs> who's, like, who's gonna fund that right so my experience with funding is working as an organization and sometimes even just getting funding to re-grant mm -hmm. right so i'm curious when you're applying for a grant to create art what happens if you propose the first thing you talked about but you end up making the latter or some version of that is in the grant funding process. Is that valid in your experience? Yeah, I think it's valid. I think most of the time, like, frankly, ain't nobody coming to watch your stuff. Like the people giving you the money, they ain't showing up. Like they never do. Even in a city as small as Akron, like the funders don't show up to the shows, you know, because from their standpoint, they have this, like they can't show up to some people's stuff and not show up to others. So they kind of have to stay neutral. So I'm sure you can make what you want to make. I think my point is like, but why can't I just write what I want to make from the get-go, right? right like, right, why do yeah. I have to write this and then like on the back end, 
create something compl- completely different. Wait, because lying shouldn't yeah, be built right, into right, the process, right, right? Right, you shouldn't have to lie <laughs> to get some money, right? Right. Especially when, like, your homies around the city, again, can make stuff about circles and squares and get that money. Like, that's that's crazy. Yes. Like, that's crazy yes. that they can do that. You're just like, well, wait a minute. Why? What? You know? And the only reason I can make something about circles and squares is if, if the square represents, like, black life and me being trapped inside of it. Right? Like, that's... You can get me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's what we're doing. <laughs> so we're, I'm going to move a little bit yep, away from yep. money, because since as neither of us are experts in yep. arts funding... Um, is there anything in the research process that you've done for either um, work that surprised you that you learned? You know, when I was doing um, the initial research for Art in the Black Heart back in like 2016-17, admittingly, I had this really, really strong opinion um, because the piece was from this vantage point of like us black folks sometimes do the thing to each other where we're like, you're not black enough. Like, you don't, why do you like that? You know what I mean? Like, you act white, and I suffered a lot from that. Like, I played soccer growing up. Around the world, it's a very black thing. In America, it's a very white thing. I danced, which you would think, like, dance is a black thing. Not in middle of America, right? Going to a corner studio, that ain't it. I didn't play football. I didn't play basketball. And I was really good at these things. I really loved these things. But I was always, like, that feeling of, like, you act white, you are white. My sister also, you know was told this stuff by, like, family members, like, that she had, like, a proper voice, right? So I had this, like, feeling about the, the research about, like, I need to figure out, like, why we do this to each other. And I had, like, all these opinions. And then one day I asked my grandma about it. Why do we do that? And she simply said, like, for protection. And I was like, what? Like, what do you mean? And she goes, you know, you have to remember, like, when black people got here, like, let's just take, like, when we came, you know, the Atlantic slave trade, like, there was a bunch of people in a boat who spoke many, many different languages. They had to create a language they could all understand in order to survive. So that principle had to continue happening throughout American history. Black people don't have a culture outside of the thing we literally built since we got here. So we hold very strong to the thing that we built. And if someone takes themselves outside of the perception of what we build, we're like, why are you doing that? That's dangerous. Because we can't protect you out there. Yeah. Like, if you decide to go play soccer with all them white boys, there's nothing we can do for you. But if you play basketball inside of our sphere, we can protect you here. So it's actually about a protection thing. And that flipped my whole understanding of this piece I was making. That, like... Black folks aren't telling black folks you're not black enough because they're being mean or they're just like ostracizing you or whatever. That a lot of times, it's, whether they realize it or not, is because they're trying to protect you, right? And then the weird part is eventually you get like, you know, Venus and Serena who are doing this like white sport and they're so great. And then we celebrate you once we realize you're safe because you're so good. But in the process, there's just this like, why are you doing that? Like, why, why would you do that? Why would you be around all those folks? And doing that thing. So that's something that really, really surprised me about that work. In in Cop Negro, one of the things that really, really hit me, I'm still dealing with, we're going to release season two in May, and I just got done writing this episode. I was interviewing the commissioner in Lawrence, Kansas, about police relations in their city and things like that. And at some point in the interview, I asked something about black women and police brutality. And then this whole conversation opened up about how the experience of black women is very different than the experience of black men. But because we live in this patriarchal system, the attention gets put towards the black men. And respectfully, and sometimes it's hard to say because these people were murdered by police, if you think about the reaction to Breonna Taylor, who was like straight up in her house Asleep. Mur- asleep and murdered and then the reaction to George Floyd which literally flipped the entire world upside down there's no reason that same thing shouldn't have happened for her or Sandra Bland or those folks and it really like again like flipped I was like holy shit I hadn't even thought about that like I, I'm so like focused on a black male experience as a black male mm-hmm. I hadn't even considered 
what black women go through. I just assumed it was the same. So I started doing a bunch of research and kind of like came to this realization that like black women are at the very center of every movement for black lives in American history. And the women's movement. Yeah. Yeah, literally. My favorite story is, I'm forgetting the artist's name, very famous art, musical artist in um, the 60s. She was standing behind Martin Luther King, ironically, today is MLK Day. Um, and during his I Have a Dream speech, he was bombing the speech, bombing it. It like, was not going well. And then because she had heard him so much and she had talked to him so much, he had talked about this dream that he has, like, privately. And at one point in... I've heard that you can hear it in the speech. She yells from behind, tell them about the dream, Martin. And then this speech that we all know happened. And that's like the perfect word picture for black women mm. when it comes to the moving on black lives. Like they're the foundation, they're the, the backbone, and they're always there um, to protect black men first, even at the expense of themselves. And so I'm writing this episode and I'm like, in the episode, I started talking, reflecting a lot about like me in the process, in this process, and how like how close-minded I've been to this process, and like how maybe I I haven't been protecting Black women as part of this process, and like well, what do I do about that as a Black male? Yeah. Um, so that was the thing that like, I mean, I'm still like writing that episode like, wow, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you know, I also come from a family where I was raised by four generations of Black women. Mm. And I'm like, well, I, but I'm doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're all doing it. So it, it's just really, you know, the re research process of making art, to me, the point of it is to not go in as an expert in the research process and come out different by the end. Art making should change your life as much as it changes other people's lives. And that's how we keep growing. Yeah, so you just reflected on a really large part of of that process and and of life and the thing that I keep coming back to in my head is that we are both parents mm -hmm. and you have a boy and a girl yep two and one yeah kind of going into this conversation about safety and what are you going to say to your boy mm -hmm. you're also in a lot of ways now thinking about how does that conversation look different similar yeah but still very different mm -hmm. for a girl. That's part of what I'm reflecting on is like, how do I do that? And now I'm like, you know, the show's going to be premiered in June. It'll show be a show. And I'm like, but now I have to keep researching because now I need to know things, right? Like I'm not done with this project because I got to keep going. because I have to understand what I'm going to say to Naomi. Right. Which I say is similar, but it's different. Part of it is like, how do I also talk to her and teach her about like not protecting others at the expense of her own life. Yeah. When that's, I think, the nature of where society has put black women. Um, how do I teach her that? Like, right. you know, like, love your brother, but, like, you can't lose yourself in protecting your brother in this world, right? right? He's also responsible for protecting you. Yeah. Right? And, and making sure she knows that and he knows that. Right. You know, so it's really, like, being a parent changed my life when it came to making art. Well, and the, I mean, that's similar to how I feel about my boys. I have, I have two twin boys, but my perception of what I need to teach them about safety is so completely different. The version of what you need to say is so is just so drastically different than, mm -hmm. you know, what I do. I'll never understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll never I'll never know what it's going to feel like to be in your shoes. But what I want to know from your perspective, is there anything I can do in raising my boys to make the world safer for your kids? I think a lot of it is, is the earlier white kids can realize that the world's different for them. Yeah. Like it's completely different teaching them to have the eyes that see. Cause often what happens, like I think about in school, right? Like in public school in Akron, like how many times, like, you see black kids like being targeted by teachers and resource officers and all these things. And all the white kids just be walking down the hall, just laughing. And, and, and it's like a perfect word picture for like what it's like outside the school. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so, you know, one of my things is like, how do we teach white kids to also be like aware of like those experiences that we talk about, they literally happen 
when you're around, like they're happening in school, they're happening. And how can you be an advocate and a champion for other kids, for other people, even when it means you may end up having to sacrifice something? It might mean that you- And are you sacrificing something? Right. Or do we really have all these resources? Exactly. And it's like, you know, so yeah, you might step up for your friend in school, you might get suspended. Well- and and what would have happened and, and had what, you not right right, right. and what, gonna, what would that kid might have went to jail he might have whatever like what's going to happen to you is never going to be as bad as what's going to be happen to your black counterpart mm-hmm. so sacrifice looks like you get suspended from school you get in trouble da 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 like and well and that says to me teach them mm-hmm. but then also be there to remind them mm-hmm. that that choice of that that got them to that mm-hmm. suspension is not something that I can be angry about exactly right? exactly right exactly yeah yeah and yeah as a parent being like and then as a parent going up to the school and being like let's talk about whether they're suspended let's talk about why they right. did something wrong let's talk about why you're doing that to the black kid in the first place right so now we have like the black kid not only has a champion in his friend his colleague he also has a champion that colleague's parent and now all of a sudden, like, you know, they don't want that smoke, right? Right. And that, and that's two levels of responsibility. And I, ha- I haven't quite thought about it in that way. Also now just realizing this isn't a parenting podcast, even though I think maybe <laughs> it should be. <laughs> um, so I do want to... I- I do want to ask you a few things yeah. also about the professional yeah. touring industry. So you're represented in the performing arts industry by Shaw Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you look for in selecting an agent that would represent this work that's so deeply personal? Here's was crazy. I didn't look for anything. He found me. There was a conference called IPAY, International Perform- Performing Arts for Youth. I was going there for years, and I won the Colin Porter Award early on. Um, and part of the award, the second year, was you came back and you kind of, like, told everybody about what you've been up to for last year. And so it was, like, the big, like, meeting, membership meeting or whatever it used to be. And so I got went up there and had, my, like, my five minutes, and I talked about this thing I was working on called the Black Card Project, now RD the Black Card. And it, I was at the very beginning. Like, I hadn't even been in a studio yet. So I was, like, t- telling him about where it comes from, why I'm doing it, da 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 And I went and sat down, and um, as people were clapping, Simon kind of like, snuck over to me and whispered in my ear, like, hey, anything you need, I got you. I, I don't think I met Simon before that moment. So I was like, oh, cool, you know? And so, like, as time went, I just kind of kept working on the show and working on the show and checking every once in a while about how things were going. I could ask him questions about the touring industry. Like, it's just a lot of stuff I just didn't understand, right? Right. Um, and he just talked to me and give us time. We just talk and we just kind of chop it up. And when I premiered the show in 2018, um, and you know, I think I sent him a video or he came and saw it. I can't remember which one. I basically was just like, would you represent me? And he was like, yeah. But we had built a relationship over time together. Mm-hmm. So, like, he knew my heart about why I do stuff. Um, and, like, here's the thing. Like, as a creator, I don't make things quickly. So, like, from a money-making standpoint, I'm not, like, a cash cow at all because it takes me a while to make stuff because it's so personal and deep, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just not turning out shows after shows after shows. But I think because he knows me and he knows my heart and, like, why I do stuff and the care and the diligence I take with my work, it made it a perfect match because everybody on his roster, he really cares about them and believes in them even more so than what they can make. And for me, that that was the thing. Like, I need you to be about me, not just about what I can produce. Mm. Um, you actually teed me up, like, really great for this next question. If you could go back sort of to the, you know, beginning whenever you're in the process of becoming a choreographer, um, starting a business, going out on your own. What advice do you wish you could give yourself? I think the advice that I would give myself, and it's interesting because I, I was in a dance company for 10 years, and I was creating inside that dance company. And then in 2020, that's when I kind of went off of myself and started like producing my own work. And one of the things I remember running into, like I had a lot of high anxiety. You built all this in three years? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you think you're not fast? <laughs> just, I'm not that fast. <laughs> um, but I had a lot of high anxiety at the time about um, perception, perception of like where you are in your career in relationship to other people. So really what I'm talking about is comparison, yeah. right? Spending time online, looking at like what else is going on in the industry, right? Who else is making work? Who else is making TYA work? Who's also making dance work and like seeing the awards they're getting and seeing the opportunities getting 
and comparing my own journey to them, right? Like, I've worked really hard at not playing the numbers game of, like, I'm 33 and not being like, oh, when so-and-so was 33, they were this and this and that. They had won this and this and that. And when I, when I kind of slowed down and realized that my journey is specific to me, and because of that, my artwork is specific to me, so the impact I can have is also specific to me, it really changed things. But it took me a good year and a half, if not more, to get to that place of really being comfortable in my own skin of like, no, like, I'm going to make this this way. This is the process I'm going to use. If I do Incop Negro in a premiere in Akron and no one ever sees it after that, I won. And that was the change, right? Like, I think when you're part of this touring industry, you have this goal of, like, everything needs to tour. Like, everything needs to, like, go to multiple places and to feel validated. But when I got to that place where I was just like, no, nah, I could do it in June, in July for two weekends, four shows. It doesn't tour. And I succeeded. And I would, if I had to go back, I would talk to myself about comparison and defining success. Yeah. I desperately hope that show tours for years. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you all day, yeah. um, but we do need to wrap up. And I just want to say thank you, no, thank you. for sitting down with us today, yeah. um, for being so open um, and honest. And um, I have really valued this, this time in this conversation. No, so thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Danielle, thank you so much for having this conversation. I think this is the perfect example as to why it is important to talk about process behind the art that we make and the art that we're presenting to the world, because this was such an insightful conversation about what artists put in personally to their work, what they discover along the way, how it affects the final process, and how, frankly, conversation about a piece affects how we experience it and how we interpret it. And I was, frankly, blown away by all the nuances that Dominic found along the way and the exploration he did personally and how that has translated into his work um, since 2020. And, and what a mature way to look at creating work and exhibiting work. I mean, just like have that process of like his perspective on, you know, creating things from his perspective that nobody else is saying or nobody else is doing, but then that feeling of just that the perception of it, like that it doesn't necessarily matter if it doesn't live on after one weekend, or it doesn't necessarily matter that what he perceived in his piece that other people per perceive. And I thought that was a very mature approach when we so certainly like focus as an industry, like how do we focus on longevity and keeping this going forever? Whereas he's like, we're going to create it. And if it has legs, it has legs. And part of that same conversation was him talking about like the way he's not, he's no longer comparing himself to the trajectory of others in the industry and how he is settling in and, and being comfortable with his own process and, and with his own work and, and trying to stop comparing himself to others as far as where others are at, at, at certain points in their career. And I just saw a quote the other day uh, uh, where Frank Lloyd Wright did 30% of his work between the ages of 80 and 92. So it really doesn't matter timeline compared to your contemporaries when your work is coming out. And so those comparisons that you've been making really, really are so irrelevant to anything other than your own mindset. I mean, he never used the word imposter syndrome, but what he was describing really clearly was imposter syndrome comparing himself to other people and and whether you know you have those doubts about whether I'm good enough or if I belong here and uh and then Daniel brings up that he's only been in it for three years and got to that point that blew my mind it took me I think 10 or 15 to to realize oh yeah I I do belong in this position and uh, good for him I mean to get there in three years I'm just so impressed by that Daniel I have to also give you kudos because it it cracked me up when you guys started going out down what sounded like a deep finance funding kind of rabbit hole. And then you like get down a little ways and you're like, wait a minute, neither of us are funding experts. Let's go on to another topic. <laughs> no, you know, and it's like, but like we all have that experience yes, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. kind of working in those. And, um, you know, a lot of those structures are systematically, um, mm -hmm. not great. 
Uh, but you know, I didn't, I didn't want the whole conversation to be, right. uh, really tailored towards. No, it was um, great. It was perfect. Yeah. I thought. And, <laughs> and it reminded me a lot of a speaker named Vule who APAP's had a, a couple times now. And, uh, he, he focuses his whole work on this very topic, which I really, um, you know, encourage people to go out and look up. Even though neither of you are experts in philanthropy or funding structures of this at this moment, I think it is an incredibly valuable conversation and perspective to have. And I think it's why we need to have more, we as presenters, we as funders, we as um, administrators or service to the field folks need to have more in-depth conversations about why we fund things and how we fund things and what those structures are. And it made me think about like, what projects am I choosing to put forward for grant funds and what are those reasons and why are funders asking for certain things? Like interrogating that is an extremely worthwhile um, pursuit. Like Dominic said, basically like we look at artists of color to take trauma into their bodies and put it into their work. And that's not all that they are. That's not all that we are um, as people, right? It, we are not the sum of our traumas. Audiences deserve works of all sorts and of all stories and not just those that are fueled out of harm. That like, while we may not be the funders, we can be an ally and we can be good um, allies in the industry by asking those questions. And that also goes for across the board stories. So artists with disabilities, um, non-binary and LGBTQ artists, right? Like we trauma mine for quote unquote, great art all the time. Are those stories important? Absolutely. Should they be told because they're not told on a regular basis? Yes. But there are also other avenues. And I think artists also want to find the joy. It's important, but there's got to be a balance um, for both artists and presenters and funders and so on and so forth. Just like there's a balance in their lives, which is what he was talking about so beautifully, is that there's so much more to his life than that trauma. I thought it was a really great conversation about the allyship and talking about like allies of, you know, as students and then that student parent relationship and uh, what parents can be doing to advocate for their son or daughter, but also, you know, playing that ally role and figuring out why their son or daughter had to step in, um, in those situations, people who have children, like they want their kid to be that person. Um, but like, how can, as adults, can we also step into that role? I loved hearing the story about how he got connected with Simon too, and how Simon was basically, you know, there in his corner rooting for him and giving him advice without having that professional relationship yet. One thing I really respected about Dominic is that he saw something and he took action on it. You know, with concerning his podcast, he saw something that that it was causing him to think about it. And he's like, you know what? I can investigate this. I can look into it myself and I can do something about it. And I can, I can do something to answer questions for other people and to bring multiple perspectives into light that people aren't seeing. And that's very telling of the way his career is as well with starting his own company and, and choreographing and developing his shows and his things so quickly is because he really is a man of action that, that sees something and, and moves on it. And, and I really, really respect that about it. Yeah. And I want to say too, there's so much to him and his work that didn't make it into this interview. I loved listening to hearing how, how he works on his art form. I love hearing artists reflect on their art making process. And whenever he started doing those podcasts and asking people about safety, he didn't really know where it was leading. Um, he was genuinely curious. And I think even in talking with him, I could feel that curiosity. And I, again, circling back, like that is why we should be talking about the process behind art making. And I think it's incredibly valuable for us as presenters to understand that it's incredibly valuable for our audiences to understand that there are programs throughout the country that like integrate that into presentation of work as having conversation pre post. I know a lot of us do kind of like small conversations around it. But it got me this conversation got me thinking a lot about how do I do that more in my work and make sure the audience really truly understands what is behind a piece that they're seeing, whether it's a piece of visual art or, you know, a performing arts um, piece, something like that, that it really triggered a lot of that for me, Danielle. And I'm going to be thinking more deeply, deeply about that for a long time. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I do want to remind everybody listening that this podcast does not need to be just us talking and reflecting. There's so many ways that you can get in touch with us uh, all throughout uh, the week. 
Uh, so hit us up on our social media if you have something you want to add to this conversation. Um, as always, thanks for joining us. We love you. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Life. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hoek. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? (laughs) I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus I miss every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. No, you weren't. You were you were, you're you muted, were muted or unmuted, but now you're not. <laughs> now she is muted again. No, you are. You are. <laughs> okay, the controls are very confusing, Josh. <laughs> to someone who has been running around all day. Uh, Danielle, try that again, please. It's Josh's fault. Yeah, totally my fault. He designed it. Damn it, Josh. It's like they copy and paste the same controls from Zoom. <laughs>